have Allie back on the podcast. Welcome, Allie. Yes, I'm so excited to be back. I can't believe it's been two full years. Like what? I know, I know. So fill us in. What has changed for you since the summer of 2020 when we last checked in about methotrexate and other medications? What has been going on? Oh my goodness. A huge roller coaster, honestly. Um, so last time I chat with you guys, it was summer of 2020. I believe I was on 10, uh, pills, which is, I believe like 25 milligrams of methotrexate. Um, I was on, that's like the highest dose usually for, um, rheumatoid arthritis patients is 10 pills a week. Um, 25 milligrams if you're injecting. Um, and again, I have not injected methotrexate. My whole journey has been with the tablets because I handle it quite well. And I'm also kind of lazy to make the switch. <laughs> um, but, um, so I was on, I was always on 10, uh, pills for, since I started back in 2016, um, until I, there was that time I went off of it, which I talked about in the last podcast. Um, and then I was doing okay. So I was on Embril, I was on methotrexate at that time, and I was able to get down all the way to three pills, um, which is like the lowest. It was like four to three. Um, and I worked my way. So you have to like work your way down to get there. So I worked my way down. We were all really excited. And then come Thanksgiving of last year. So 2021, I started to flare. Um, I was unable to squat. So if, um, anybody remembers, I'm a personal trainer, so I move for a living. Um, and I was having a hard time explaining a squat to a client and, um, I teach dance fit classes like three to five times a week. And I was having a really hard time. And so I went to my rheumatologist and I'm like, Hey, like, usually I come here and I'm feeling great, but I'm not doing so well. And she looked at my knees and she's like, you have fluid in both your knees. And I was like, Oh my goodness. So of course, when this happens, the first thing is, okay, we need to up your methotrexate. So, um, I went from, I believe it was four pills at this time. I, I doubled it. She was like, you can progress, like add on, uh, every like two weeks and knowing me, I go all in. So I said, I'm just going to double it. Um, I don't recommend that. <laughs> I recommend taking your time with it because I doubled it and cue those methotrexate hangovers. It was rough. I was, um, feeling all of those, the migraines. Um, it was very intense. It was like starting over for the first time. Um, and then what we came to find out was that, um, my, uh, Enbrel was not working. So it turns out I developed antibodies to the Enbrel medication. Um, and then over Thanksgiving break, my doctor called and said, we need to make the switch to Humira. And how many years had you been on Enbrel? Yep. It had been about two and a half years at that point. Okay. Okay. And that's a really common experience to have, like, if you're starting to feel worse, mm -hmm. like it, there's a point where you're like, should I, is there a way, any wiggle room with a biologic? Like, like with Remicade for me, we were able to kind of say, okay, instead of every six weeks, let's come every five weeks, every four weeks, let's increase the dosage versus like Enbrel. I think you don't really, you can't really switch it up mm -hmm. too much. Right. So you're like, okay, although methotrexate is what we can switch up and, but it's rough once. And I had the same thing with Enbrel. Once your body makes antibodies to the medication, it's hard to recover from that. So then, so yeah, then you got prescribed Humira. What were your feelings about having to switch? Oh yeah. So at first I was okay with it. I was actually, I was excited. Um, I like a change. So, um, it didn't really put me down. The only thing that kind of put me down was, okay. So because the embryo wasn't working, so it wasn't really doing anything for me. And I was down to four pills of methotrexate. It kind of just goes to show that my body cannot live without medication right now. And I think that's where my heart kind of broke a little bit because I'm like nowhere near remission. So basically I was on four pills of methotrexate and for spoonies, that's not much at all. Um, it's just to keep those there's a word for it, but it's just to keep like those antibodies in there. Um, so actually I'm not allowed to go off methotrexate until I try to get pregnant, um, just to keep my body used to it. So, um, we're not used to it, but you know, continue that. So anyway, so it kind of broke my heart a little bit that because I was on the lowest types of medication, my body still could not handle that. Um, because even though on medication, I was feeling so good, I thought I was in medicated remission. Um, it kind of hurt a little bit to know I'm not in a medicated remission. I'm actually nowhere near remission. But um, I let myself feel those feelings. I had my pity party. I mean, it was Thanksgiving. So like I ate all the fun things. Um, <laughs> uh, I was with family and I got the news right before we went to like a Christmas parade. So it wasn't that big of a hit. Um, and yeah. And so then I started Humera about two weeks after that. And I remember, so for those of you who don't follow Allie on social media, you need to <laughs> another day with RA on Instagram She's and, and TikTok. She's got just entertainment value and, <laughs> and 
helpful insights and motivation and good ideas for, you know, physical, you know, physical activity and such. But, um, I remember, you know, you, you just, you've done a great job of just sharing like those ups and downs with such, you know, honesty. And I think it is a little bit scary for a lot of people. Like, even if you have hope, like starting a new medication, you're like, okay, because my body didn't make antibodies to the other one, but it worked before then, at least I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's yeah. what I usually think. Okay. But it worked really, really well until my body had made antibodies. So maybe the next one will also work really well, you know, until yeah. I'm maybe hopefully don't, but until the antibodies do. and then yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like, so um when you started Humira, like how how was your response? Did you have any side effects or um no side effects except for maybe one fatigue? Um, I noticed and it could have been because my body was flaring, like I was in a full body flare, uh, knees full of fluid, my elbows were hurting, I just was feeling awful. Um, and I was also, I didn't mention this, but I was taking steroids and the strongest NSAID you could possibly take because for I don't react well to NSAIDs, like it doesn't help me at all. So she put me on the strongest one. So with prednisone, NSAID, starting Humira and doubling my methotrexate, I felt awful. So I don't really know if it was the Humira. I think it was the combination of everything. <laughs> um, uh-huh. yes. Cause the NSAIDs and prednisone combination is not fun if anybody has done it. Um, yeah. and I was working and I was still teaching class and group fitness and I was trying my best, but I would have to modify and even tell them, Hey guys, I can't move today. We have to not dance and do something else. Um, but yeah, so the fatigue was something I noticed after I stopped the prednisone, stopped the NSAIDs because I was only on those for about two, three weeks. Um, I noticed I was very tired and exhausted. So fatigue is not just being sleepy. It's like you just don't have motivation to get up. You just your body is exhausted as well as your mind. And so I noticed that and I started I was never a nap taker. If you follow me on social media, I'm very hyper. Um, I'm, I'm up at 415 every day and I never used to nap until I started Humira. And then I started to nap about like two hours a day and it would knock me on my butt and I would be in bed and I'd be sleeping. And then I'd wake up feeling really groggy because I'm not used to it. So that was the biggest side effect with Humira. And I'm pretty sure it's, um, it's the Humira that's causing that. Uh, that's so hard though. You touched on something that I think a lot of people listening will identify with, which is it's like, what's causing what, you know, Mm -hmm. like you don't, and ideally to know like, okay, is my fatigue from X medicine or from the disease? You'd be like, well, what if I don't take this medicine and then see how bad it is? But when you have multiple medicines and you can't risk going off them just to like understand better what's going on, unless it's like a terrible side effect. Like let's say for some people, methotrexate is makes them so nauseous that they can't even eat Mm -hmm. at all. You know, it's just, it can be so difficult to cope with that uncertainty. Or I think many of us too, like okay, if you're feeling, you know, like you have a little cold or like your body's fighting something and then you're like, okay, well, is it my body fighting something or is it, you know, am I feeling more tired because of this or that? So, but yeah, since you went off the prednisone too, like, could you be having a rebound of fatigue where like, cause I know at least for me, prednisone makes me really even more hyper than usual, yeah. which is like <laughs> kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> and then I get, if I go off of it and I get tired, but yes, yeah, so, but now it's been persisting this mm-hmm. fatigue. Oh um, yeah but has it been helping your, your disease overall? Do you think, or I do, um, I don't have fluid on my knees. I just had my checkup last week. So, um, mm-hmm. if you're a methotrexate, usually you go to your rheumatologist every three months to get your labs done and to kind of check you out. I'm the person that likes to go in person versus virtual, um, mm-hmm. because I want them to look at my joints and look at my knees. I even wear shorts in the winter so that they can check my knees out. Um, you don't have to do that, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I went to my checkup and everything is looking good. My labs are great and I'm feeling not hundred percent, but I'm feeling a lot better than the full body flare I was experiencing, um, over Thanksgiving. So I think it's, I think it's working. Um, the only thing is I did go to the emergency room back in December. Or so a couple months ago. Um, and at first I thought the only change was Humira. So at first I was a little nervous. It was Humira cause I was having, um, I, I guess pelvic pain. So it was like low, low stomach, like in that pelvic area, like where, um, our women organs are. So I was having pain there and they could not figure it out. And I thought maybe, oh, maybe it's Humira, but I checked in with my doctor and she said, that's not a usual side effect. So if you're listening, you do want to notate, um, these moments. And, um, I just ordered a medical journal, so I'm going to notate how I feel every single day. And, um, also let your doctor know, um, those side effects from your new medication, because it gives you peace of mind. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's, it's so hard. And I know that, yeah, we should do a whole episode on like 
track symptom tracking mm-hmm. and because that can be so so crucial especially when you get into the emergency situations to have something that like someone else even like a family member could bring to, to communicate mm-hmm. to the doctors too mm-hmm. yeah but, um yeah and to learn your own um your own triggers and so have you did you get any resolution was the pelvic pain from like the gi issues or i know you've had gastrointestinal you and i are well, buddies with having gastrointestinal issues yeah. Yeah. <laughs> along with yeah. RA, which is common, but still it feels to me like no one completely understands like mm-hmm. what to do about it. <laughs> yeah. Especially when they realize that we have RA and they tend to dismiss us and say, it's your RA. And I'm like, yeah. well, okay, but can we like d- dig deeper? And I'm sure we could do a whole podcast about this episode, but, um, but yeah, so I actually, I went to the GYN and she kind of dismissed me a little bit. Um, I don't know. Cause I'm, I'm always going to the doctor because I have so many issues. And I think, or at least what I felt was that she thought, okay, she's back again. Like (laughs) nothing's wrong with her. And so she dismissed me. I thought it was endometriosis. She assured me it's not, even though I'm not hundred percent sure, but no resolution went to my GI. They have me on a really fun diet of being vegan, gluten-free, low FODMAP, plus the 25 items I can't eat. Um, (laughs) So yeah. the things us Spoonies do to try to feel better is, is rough, but no resolution yet. Uh, we're still waiting on some tests and hopefully get that figured out. Cause I don't want to trip to the ER again. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. That's, and I know you've had costochondritis before, mm. and that's like the inflammation where the rib cage meets the sternum. And sorry, I'm like remembering my own story. Yes. I ended up listening to yours. Cause that's, I've actually only ever been to the ER as a patient once. Okay. And it was when I had my first flare of costochondritis and I thought yes. I was having a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And I had been, in, when I had been in a car diff- accident four months ago and I hadn't had nerve pain down my arm that much. I'd had pain in my neck, but I had suddenly had this pain in my chest and some nerve pain, like numbness and tingling down my arm. And I know for in my left arm, I know yes. for women, those are like signs of a heart attack. And then yes. I started like panicking and having shortness of breath. And like, but is it from panicking or is it from, you know? So of course I immediately in the ER get diagnosed as like a hypochondriac, even though I've never been to the ER before. Yes. And I was true that I wasn't having a medical emergency, but I, yeah, I did have costochondritis, which closely mimics the symptoms of a heart attack because of just the severity of the chest pain. So it does. Yeah. It does. They say we can't figure out if we can't differentiate the two. And I would be like, okay, then how do we know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Cause that's what, if you read online, it says you can't differentiate the two. It's just as painful. Yeah. So I guess you just have to go to rule it out. Cause you don't want to be like so scared of being accused of being hypochondriac and that you like Mm -hmm. die of an actual heart attack. Exactly. It took, it took them about five, six years to diagnose me with costochondritis after being like dismissed and being, um, misdiagnosed it took him five years oh, I'm so sorry <laughs> and two ER visits thinking I was dying <laughs> oh that's so scary yeah yes. so and of scary. course RA makes it worse as the rheumatologists mm-hmm. tell us because if we have like anybody can get costo it's not an autoimmune disease so if we have RA it just makes the inflammation way worse <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah oh I'm so I'm so sorry but I know so you could see like the topic of today is supposed to be like quote-unquote supposed to be methotrexate but like everything's all interwoven, you know, like you don't, and let some people do what that's called monotherapy of methotrexate, where they just, they have RA and they take methotrexate. And actually mm-hmm. quite a few people, I didn't realize this till I was looking in one of like the scientific journals. And it said like, this is from a 2019 article. It said like 50% of people do well. I don't know how they mm-hmm. qualified well or quantified it uh, on methotrexate monotherapy who have rheumatoid arthritis. And then, and so we're kind of part of the population that needs the additional biologic and additional, um, but, but anyway, but point being is just, you know, yeah, like you start talking about methotrexate and then it, you know, it spiral because you're not going through just methotrexate. You're having, you know, other GI issues, pelvic pain, and then you're having biologics up and down. And then you're trying to like have a life as like a human being who like wants to be an amazing personal trainer and is doing an (laughs) amazing job. Despite all this, I don't even like, how are you coping? I don't even know. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's not easy. Um, it's easier when, um, you're doing okay on medication and everything is just fine. Um, and I was that person that did well on methotrexate. I mean, for a good four or five years, I did really well. Um, and so it definitely exists and it worked right away for me, which is great because biologics can take a while. Methotrexate, I think is about like six weeks. Um, and it worked right away. So love that. And I love that half of the percentage is doing well and that brings me joy. But coping, I mean, I'm doing okay. Of course, with COVID, it's really tricky. It's really hard. Um, 
especially upping my methotrexate and the fatigue that I've experienced with that in Humira. I just, I don't really want to socialize. It's also with COVID because with us Spoonies, like we're more cautious about it. And I think people, even though with Omicron, which is if you're listening to this podcast right now <laughs> is intense, but um, people are starting to calm down again and like get more comfortable. And I'm still like, no, I just, I'm not comfortable to meet up. I'm stressed about it. I'm still stressed in public. I'm a little stressed because I work with clients in person. So I always have like a KN95 or whatever those are um, on, but um, coping with it. It's hard. It's not easy. Um, that's why I use Instagram as an outlet. Um, so whenever I'm having a hard time, I make a reel. Um, so actually, if you ever see a reel, it's usually because I'm having a hard time and I try to make it funny. <laughs> Um, yeah. 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 So. And that's something people don't always understand. I do the same thing. And then they'll be like, oh, she's so happy because she's like smiling or dancing mm-hmm. around. And you're like, this is a coping mechanism. It is. Yes. I mean, or We're sometimes dying. It, is. Like, it depends. <laughs> like sometimes it is like, I'm legitimately feeling good yeah. today and I'm going to do this. But I think it's, it, there's like a cognitive dissonance, right? If you see someone who looks like they're smiling, mm-hmm. then you're like, they must be just like carefree and happy. And like, I mm-hmm. wish I was, I wish I had what they have. And then you realize, okay you wouldn't necessarily want to trade places because of all the difficulty. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that also goes with methotrexate on the topic of methotrexate. Um, I don't want Spoonies to get discouraged because methotrexate can be a roller coaster ride. So like when we chatted in 2020, I was on 10 pills. And then between that time I went down to three and then I was up at four and then I went down to three. And um, now I'm back up at um, eight right now, eight or 10. Um, we're probably going to keep increasing. But I used to watch other Spoonies and I would see them go off of methotrexate and they would be so excited and they would post a video or a reel and they would be like, I'm going off. Like I made it, I did it. I'm in remission. And my heart would sink and I would feel so upset. Um, and then like that same person, maybe a couple months later had to go back on it. So, um, that's why I try not to talk too much about the dosage I'm on on podcasts. I don't mind. I would love to tell you guys, and I'm an open book. So if you DM me, I'll tell you, but whenever I post a reel, I'm always like, I don't want people to feel bad that I'm going down because you have no idea. I'll probably go back up in like six months. So just saying that and putting that out there in case you see somebody and you get really sad and discouraged, just know it's a roller coaster, right? So yeah. we may feel good at some points. We should celebrate those people. Um, Cause at first I would feel a little jealous and sad, but now I'm like, I get it. I get it now. <laughs> no. And it, it though, you've touched on so many good things in that, in that reflection. And I think it brings me back to like mindfulness, right? And like, so often it's like mindfulness is like Sometimes people like spoonies, spoonies get annoyed if everyone's like, you just need to try mindfulness or, you know, like that's, I mean, mindfulness in the sense of like, you know, connection to an awareness of the present moment and the fact that this is what, this is what we get, like is the present moment Mm -hmm. and it might get better in the future. It might get worse. And like, that is something that I really feel like I've learned through chronic illness. Cause in the past I was like such a control freak and I'm still like a recovering control freak, but like, like what you just said, it's like, you really, it showed me like the acceptance or the understanding you have that like, it's up and down. Like, it's just going to be like, you might be on four mil or four pills this month it might be eight months, eight pills next month, mm-hmm. you know, and the sooner that people can kind of come to terms with that, rather than saying like, I have RA and all I need to do is figure out like the perfect amount or the perfect, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? Because the more yeah. you attach yourself to that, like, there's just this one way of coping with it. Mm-hmm. You're setting yourself up for failure because it's going to change. Yeah. I mean, we have this for life. So it's going to be a roller coaster. Some days are going to be great. Some are going to be really bad. And we just have to look forward to those better days and support one another, even if somebody's going into remission and we're super jealous. Um, yeah. It's it's life. It's like for life. So they're probably not going to be in remission that long and they're going to come right back up. So um, yeah. Everything is impermanent. And I think also with you brought up, you brought up jealousy, I think it's maybe, maybe I'm maybe I'm, this is wishful thinking, but I think it is really possible at the same time to feel like jealous or envious about someone else's remission while also truly feeling happy for them, you know, and feeling like, oh, like I, in the, in a different episode that maybe will have already come out at this time, uh, I was talking with two um, other women, uh, autoimmune coaches about, you know, their journeys. And we talked about how, yeah, it's hard when you're not doing well, that to see on Instagram, someone like who's you know, in remission or whatnot, but, um, to say like, what does jealousy tell, what is my jealousy or envy telling me? Like, it tells me that 
this is something that I want, you know, or this is something yeah. that I value mm-hmm. and they have it. And, you know, I can do, there's a zone of control that I have. Like I can control my actions. Maybe in your case, what you're eating, what, you know, how much medication you're taking, your communication with your doctor. And then there's a zone outside of that that you can't control. Like mm-hmm. you can't necessarily control like whether your body is going to make antibodies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it just kind of decides to do that sometimes. Yep. Yep. But yeah, it's just, yeah, sorry, but just went on my own. No, no, it's, it's but, important. Yeah. 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 Especially with social media. It's very important. <laughs> well, yeah, especially with social media. And oh yeah, the th- other thing I was going to say, I don't know whether you have a soapbox on this, but I mean, this might sound controversial, but I honestly feel like you don't get like a badge or a like, prize for controlling your disease one way or another. Yeah. Like I don't feel like when I was in unmedicated remission during my pregnancy, I don't feel like that was like an accomplishment that mm-hmm. I needed like a badge for versus when I've been on, you know, the maximum 25 milligrams of methotrexate injected with like the maximum amount of biologics and pregnancy. Like none like I kind of feel like there's this false hierarchy people get sucked into where like just to be blunt, like if you can like eat the perfect diet and like control your disease perfectly, like you get like a prize, like we're all going to die in the yeah, end. Like, exactly. Yes. <laughs> like we're trying, like we want to have the best quality of life we can have possible, mm-hmm. you know, but sorry, do you have thoughts on that? I don't want to put you in an awkward position. No, no, it's not awkward at all. No. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Especially with this diet I'm doing right now. Like this is no way to live. Like <laughs> I don't care if I see people like on Instagram who are like, I am in remission because I'm eating this very clean diet and I exercise and I do that. Like, that's great. Good for you. But like, not all of us can do that. And you know, I post about this all the time on my reels that yeah. like we may want to live that life but also we may need medication and that's okay too it doesn't matter if you're in a mission that's great if you need medication that's great too some of us need a little extra help but we also want a like quality of life we want to have fun I want to go out and have some tacos like I <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. So, yeah there is no badge for however you handle the situation and I always say treat yourself after you inject like get some chocolate do something fun um mm-hmm. but absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. no 100% agree yeah. And I love you. You've done a lot of work on, you know, um, against medication shaming, or like that's like a double negative, like, you know, anti shaming people for taking Western medication. And again, yeah. like it's, I don't want to invalidate. Like if someone's worked really, really hard, like I know people who sacrifice a lot and work really yes. hard to like be able to afford like a clean diet or organic foods and, and have invested a lot. And that's, and that's what they value. And that truly brings them like a sense of like, this is working, like that's working and that's great. But yeah. I don't, the, the, the part that I think is, can be toxic on social media is when you, um, people imply or outright say that my way is better. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, like I'm like, I used to, you know, live a completely like quote unquote normal life on Enbrel and methotrexate, like, and I don't think that that would have been, there's some value judgment that I would have been better if that Mm -hmm. had been able to be achieved through diet and exercise and like quote unquote natural methods, like. The yeah. point is to get to where you can, you know, function in your life and have a good quality of life. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And all of our disease is different. It's very progressive or maybe it's not, but um, yeah. 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 That's so, I don't think they think about like, this is not just like, we feel like shit it's attacking our body and we can have joint damage and things can happen. So <laughs> yeah. 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 Actually it's interesting. I was talking to a naturopath about this, who I really trust so she has ulcerative colitis. She's my mm-hmm. naturopath that I get advice for, for my stomach and a little bit for the RA, but yeah, she's like, you know, you're just, you're, you have a more aggressive form of RA. Like you mm-hmm. need the medication. And she's like, some people like, I would advise them if their RA is like, in, you know, really not, ag- really, really not severe and really not aggressive. Like, yeah, I would go more all in, but she's like, you know, a lot of people don't understand that nuance. Like not all RA is created equal, you know? Um, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> so we could talk, we could talk all day in our soapboxes, but is there anything else you would want just now that I have you here, your wisdom, uh, was there anything else you'd want the audience to know, um, or like, um, either about methotrexate or just, just any parting words of wisdom? Yeah. Words of wisdom. Um, so I get a lot of DMS about people just starting methotrexate and actually, uh, I wish I started sooner because I probably caused joint damage to my body, avoiding it because I was so afraid. Um, and at the time I didn't have a rheumatologist I could trust. So I kind of felt like a guinea pig. I felt like she was throwing drugs on me. And then you read the words low dose of chemo, which again, it's very, very, very low dose, very low dose. Um, and then you get scared. Um, but my, 
best advice is to talk to your doctor about it straight up, go to your doctor and say, Hey, I'm scared. I'm scared of this. I'm scared of this. I'm scared of side effects. And they'll give you a peace of mind. So when you start methotrexate, it is scary, but you have a huge support system with us. We have a lot of friends on it. If you want to DM me, that's great. I would love to talk about it, but first go to your doctor, let them know what you're afraid of. And they'll tell you, Hey, we're going to monitor you for every month. We're going to do some labs. We're going to make sure nothing happens. We're going to make sure you're okay. Cause a lot of people DM me and say, I've been avoiding it for months. And I'm thinking, oh my God, their poor joints, like how are they walking? And cause that's what I did. I didn't have it social media at the time. So I waited and I don't know, I waited for seven weeks and I really wish I didn't do that. Cause I could have really hurt myself. Um, that's when I got my knee drained seven times in a row. So, um, <laughs> don't do that. Talk your to your knee doctor. Drained, you said, yeah, right? drained. Yeah. Oh. Once a week for seven oh, weeks. Wow. Yeah. Finally at the last week, they were like, you can, you can get very sick if we drain your knee again. And so I finally, they, they kind of, I kind of forced on methotrexate a little bit, <laughs> but I was that person. I was that person that avoided it. I was so scared. I didn't know anybody on it. I read the low dose of chemo freaked out, but yes, please talk very to me. Very common. Yes, absolutely. So don't, don't wait, write your list down, either message your doctor on a portal, go in person and write, and they'll give you a peace of mind. Um, I think that's my best piece of advice. Also spoil yourself after you take it. <laughs> no, those are, those are great. And I think one of the most common things I've seen that you alluded to is people exclusively comparing the possible risks or downsides of methotrexate and not considering at all the potential benefits mm -hmm. of it, methotrexate and considering the potential risks of inaction. Like you yeah. said, like the inaction, not taking the action of taking it is a risk. And it's very, very hard right. for humans to like get that, but it's like, okay, well, if you go out, if you think about an analogy, like sunscreen, like going out in the sun, if you have, have like really pale skin, like mine, you know, going out in the sun for like four hours, like there's an action I can take that would like mitigate the risk right yeah. of putting on sunscreen but um anyway yeah so it's just That's a it's, great way to put it yeah yeah it's like there's all this really interesting health um public health research where it's like health promotion behaviors versus health detection behaviors like getting a mammogram which could like detect an issue versus like an something like sunscreen that's like protective anyway it's mm -hmm. hard and i don't yeah i i think you're very right to to help or sorry not you're right. Like you don't need my approval, but like, I think that the more that people are exposed to a, the fact that like, not everyone has terrible side effects, of methotrexate, yeah. like, yeah. you know, and that, um, there is a risk of not taking it. It can help them make a more balanced decision. And, you know, one of the best other things I'll say real quick is, um, this, uh, nurse practitioner who focuses exclusively in rheumatology, Christine, who I'm going to have on the podcast. She said, you know, when, I, when people are really hesitant to start a med, I just tell them it's like, it's a dating it's not a marriage. Like yeah. if you start with the trexate and you feel like complete crap, like you don't have to stay on it forever. Yeah, like it doesn't exactly. stay. It's not like one of those like birth control shots that like stays in your body for five years or whatever, you know? Yes. So, yeah. It's temporary um, and you can always change. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah. Exactly. And like, give I it about not, two months because yeah. it's usually two months. You're not feeling so good. Give it about two months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. It can be kind of like some meds where the side effects are bad in the beginning and then they go away. So yeah. Well, thank you. Got adjusted. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Thank, thank you. you so, so much. This is just, I know this is helping so many people. I got such good feedback. I mean, like I, maybe I didn't even say, say this yet on this part of the, this episode, but that my most downloaded episode of all the arthritis life podcast has been what's it like to be on the track site? Like episode yes. five. So I'm just so grateful that you're able to come back. Cause I know people are dying to hear the update now. <laughs> I love it. A lot I can't of sleep in two years. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank love you it. again. Nice. Thank you for having me. I love talking about this. And feel free to slide into the DMs if you have any questions. I love talking about it. Yes. Another day with RA. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>